Hi there, everybody. Welcome. This is Drawing Together. I'm Scott with Artist Network. Um, we see a, a nice large audience today. Uh, we are working on this mountain stream, um, working in graphite again today. So if you're following along, you're going to find a list of the materials in the description below, as well as the reference image. Um, you know, we've got it up here. So if you feel like just watching and then kind of applying this um, you know, to your, your work later, uh, feel free. Um, and also, I've seen some really amazing work being posted this week um, on artistnetwork.com, where if you go to the Drawing Together pages, you will find, um, uh, you'll, you'll have the ability to share your work and comment and do all sorts of things. And so, um, I think I think we're all set to go. I, you'll, you'll have the ability to share your work and comment and do all sorts of things. And so, um, I think I think we're all set to go. I want to uh, just scan through this real quickly to see if there are any questions or a lot of comments to get through. So if you are if you do have any questions, feel free to um, type them out in all caps. They're just going to make it more visible for me, and I'm going to do my best to get to all of the questions as they come through. Uh, Roberto asking, "What is your biggest inspiration?" That is a that is a tricky one. Let me think about that. If, it, if we're talking about who, who is, as artists have been influenced by, there's um, several. Um, you know, I think probably one of the biggest is a, an artist named Neil Welliver, an artist from Maine. Um, and then there is a, another artist named uh, James Perry Wilson, who did the backgrounds for the, the, the diorama exhibits in the Natural History Museum. Um, so I had some of his, his work growing up in, in our house, and that was a huge inspiration. So a lot of landscape artists and just nature in general is my, my biggest inspiration. Um, so, but that's a good question. I think we can kind of talk about that more. So if you're following along, um, I'm gonna talk through what I do as an artist, but I'll of, often we'll kind of go on different tangents talking about art related things in general. So feel free to call out any questions, even if you don't feel like it's directly related to what's happening here. So I'm willing to, you know, kind of, I, I really like to see where those conversations go. I love seeing everybody calling out where you're from. Um, it's fantastic. A lot of familiar names here. So um, we're going to get right to it. Um, I did this preparatory sketch here on a smaller sheet of paper. Um, and, and I decided I think I'm just going to try making a little bit larger for this one. This actually went together, came together much faster than I anticipated. And it may be the fact that I'm more comfortable, more familiar with landscape work in general. Um, but I, I think one of the things that we really want to address in this is how to manage all that detail. So if we look at the reference image, there's a ton of information. And in my goal, as I've stated throughout this whole series, is to improve my skills of observation and my hand-eye coordination so when I'm out on location working from life, if I'm painting or if I'm drawing, um, I can get to that point more quickly and, and just kind of speed up that whole process. Uh, and so my mind going into this was to put myself in that location. So this is a this beautiful mountain stream. There's this old um, mine up there. This is just south of Breckenridge up in the mountains here in Colorado. Um, it's an awesome place. I love it here. And, and this is this is a photo I took in, as a potential reference for a painting, um, which I ultimately have never done, but perhaps I'll get back to it. Um, and so I in my mind, I can kind of put myself back in that lo location. Um, and I can also, you know, when I'm working through it, um, try to react to the drawing and from to the photograph in the way that I would in a work from life. So that's really my goal here is to create more of a, of a sketch where I'm gathering information and trying to capture the totality of the scene rather than getting bogged down in those details. So um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Heidi, you're going to be drawing with Prismacolor water-soluble water graphite. Awesome. Um, yeah, exactly. A 4B is about what I'm working with. Actually, I think I'm going to switch. I switched to this Prismacolor as an extra jet black, which when I tested it out um, next to the 4B pencil was pretty equivalent in, in the depth of its value. Um, so I, I'm going to work with this ebony pencil today. Um, and it's equivalent to about a 4B, maybe a 6B um, graphite pencil. If you don't have that, that's fine. Use whatever you have available to you. Um, and then I'm working on this smoother paper. It's a little bit larger. Um, it's about 16 um, inches wide here. Um, so I'm going to set, actually, you know what? I might set this up here just as a reference as well. Um, so we're going to dig right into it. Um, 
I've got my reference image in front of me. I've got the screen in front of me projecting that camera that's above. So getting me, giving me this top down view. Um, Hopefully there's no internet issues. We had some trouble this morning, but we're just gonna keep rolling. So if, if it does seem to stall or if you lose me, um, hang on for a few seconds. It sometimes just takes a few seconds to reload. So um, just to kind of throw that out that early. Um, one of the things that I did initially when I, uh, when I attempted this sketch was to try to, to think about um, blocking this in in, in a bit of a no-tan fashion. If you're not familiar with what a no-tan is, it's essentially a it's a it's a black and white um, interpretation of the scene, breaking it down to either just white or black. And so maybe you're looking at the shape of the light that becomes white, the shape of the shadow becomes black. Or if you see generally dark values, they become all black, um, and then generally light values all get lumped into white. But the idea is to think about major forms here, um, and. As you can see, I'm using the side of the pencil. I get a lot of questions about how I sharpen these pencils, so I can kind of show you really quickly, but I've got this razor blade, and I just kind of push with my thumb, kind of carving into, uh, you know, into that, uh, that core release, you know, kind of showing the, the core of the pencil here, um, and carving that back, and then, uh, you know, just kind of sanding it down to a fine point. So I actually used a pencil sharpener to get most of the way to a, a fine point. Then I scraped it on the side, um, kind of rolling it in my fingers to get this kind of relatively sharp point. But I need a, an inch or so of that, um, that graphite exposed from the core so that I can um, block in these major areas quickly. Uh, so that's, this is, this is what I'm kind of thinking about now. I'm, rack, I'm moving my eyes back and forth um, very quickly to, uh, and to kind of react to the, uh, the image in front of me. And so I'm looking for basic shapes of light and dark. I'm gonna bring this down actually a little, little bit. So up here I'm thinking about that edge of the rock here. Um, thinking about that, that little, kind of, there's a one stage of the waterfall up here. And then there's all of these trees, and I'm not even gonna be thinking about the individual trees at this moment. I'm just thinking about blocking in those values. And actually, as I'm doing this, I'm seeing these masses of, of value kind of playing out on the page, and I'm not sure I like the balance that I'm achieving here a little, I think everything off a little bit too much to the, to the left. So I want to uh, bring this over using my kneaded eraser. So I've got my, really the only tools I have right now are my, my ebony pencil, kneaded eraser, and a rubber eraser. Keeping it simple. I think what was happening earlier on the series, if you're new, uh, it might be helpful to go back and watch some of the other series after this is done. Um, but you know, I think what was happening is I was gradually kind of adding more materials to it. And so I, this week is really all about stripping that down to really simple materials. Um, if you have you know, one pencil, one eraser, just kind of go for it um, and see how far we can push those materials. Um, keeping my eyes really blurred at this moment because I don't want to get bogged down in those details and I'm just trying to see the masses of the forms. Um, and when we get down to this rock, um, I'm thinking about you know, it as a dark value. And this is one of the things we're gonna confront later on is the value of this rock where it's hit by that light. So I don't wanna go too dark with it, but it's also it's that contrast between the rock and the water that, um, that makes that water really, you know, kind of, uh, it creates that movement in the light on the water, all that, that white kind of foam there. The dimensions of the reference photo are a little bit different than this too. So I'm doing some cropping, maybe bringing up the, the bottom a little bit, uh, kind of cropping off a little bit of the bottom of that, that photograph. And then I'm um, just gonna keep filling in these masses. And ultimately we're, we're left with this kind of abstract light shape that I want to kind of compare to that reference photo. And the, the benefit to working this way is that 
it's like right off the bat, I'm getting to major compositional issues figured out and major um, proportions established. And so I'm, I'm, I've got these regions now. I know that that foreground rock is going to be here. We've got this tree on the right. This area are those background trees and the rocks back in here. And so then if I have those basic, um, essentially playing fields established, when I get into that level of detail that, you know, later on in the drawing, then um, I don't have to be so concerned at that point about making sure that I'm in, working in the right spot. I've got, I've got everything in the right spot. Um, because what can happen sometimes is if, if I don't do this, I run the risk of maybe finishing an area, and if that's too large or too small, as I work through the rest of the drawing, it's all gonna be influenced by that initial area. And so then I'll have to either go back and correct something if it's too large or too small later, um, or continually adjust as I go through the drawing. You know, it's interesting that, you know, uh, you were asking influences, and I mentioned Neil Welliver as one of my primary influencers. Um, he worked in a very peculiar way uh, as an oil painter. He um, would start here, and work his way down to here, never going back. So he's finishing as he's going, and he admits that it's really peculiar. It's not <laughs> generally a way that most people work. Um, and here I am with uh, one of my major influences, um, you know, working really contrary to the way I work. I think that's just uh, that's one of the exciting things about artwork. Um, I had a, an email conversation with um, a viewer, Greg, um, talking about, um, you know, just talking about drawing and, and I mentioned one of my, uh, one of the artists that I really connect with is a Spanish realist named Antonio Lopez Garcia, um, who gets very obsessive with the work and it's this really high level of detail and commitment to the work. He's always working from life. Um, and, and I, I res really respond to it. I love his work. Um, however, I don't think I could ever work that way myself. It's just not who I am as an artist. And so that can be one of the interesting things about influence is sometimes we, we admire the people who do the things that we can't, but that doesn't mean that what we're doing is wrong. So, But sometimes you got to try it on. I've tried to, to commit and apply that level of obsession, maybe working on a drawing. You know, he might work on a drawing or a painting for years, and I, I, don't know, I just don't have that in me. So... Um, Let's see, so I'm just going to keep working. I'm going to do my best to check the, um, check the comments as we go to look for any questions. So feel free to shout out. If I'm not explaining something that you're interested in why, why I'm doing something, I'll do my best to articulate it. Um, all right, but you can kind of see that basic shape there. You know, hopefully you can see in the reference photo, and it kind of helps on the screen here, uh, to see that that relationship that um, I was talking about trying to just define anything that's if it's middle gray or darker I'm essentially just making it all as one solid shape and then from within this I'm going to try to differentiate the various values um, Now what I'm doing though is I've got the screen in front of me that has the this camera projecting it so I can see my drawing Vertically and it's at a distance and this may be something that you want to do now as well is step back from your work and evaluate the proportions uh, because what I'm what I'm seeing now here is I want to refine this area, and you know there's some some of these dark areas in here that I want to address because I want to make sure everything kind of fits. And one of the th things I love about landscape work is it's a little bit more forgiving than portrait work. And if you see <laughs> if you've seen any of my portrait drawing assignments, you know that I, I struggle with those. I think you know some of them they, they come out all right, but I don't have the confidence of you know, a really dedicated portrait artist. Um, but the, um, you know, one of the things that, again, what I love about the landscape is that it's really all about capturing the space, capturing the light, and understanding the way the landscape moves or you move through it. Um, and it's often less critical to get the proportions exactly right. Um, and what I see a lot in landscape artists' work is that there's a wide range of interpretation um, and comfortability with manipulating the landscape to suit your needs. So some artists will move trees around or change the angles of mountains and streams to suit the composition. Um, and you know some are, are are the opposite, where it might they're going to be um, 
they're going to be much more concerned with it looking exactly like the landscape. Um, and then there's the whole spectrum in between, you know, from pure abstraction to 100% accurate photorealism, kind of capturing everything exactly as you see it. And then you, as an artist, you're going to be um, somewhere on that spectrum, and it, it's helpful to co try to identify where you are and just be comfortable with that. Um, so wiping this down, again, this is something, if you're new, you may not have seen this, uh, you're not going to have seen me do this before, but, um, you know, everybody who's joining in before, this is, this is something I do a lot, and um, just kind of building up, taking it down, wiping it down, and this helps to kind of unify all the values, helps to get rid of some of the hatch marks. Um, I'm not worried about preserving the brightest whites because I'm going to erase that out. But if you know, I, I know right away that if I look at that mountain stream, there are areas that are lighter and areas that are darker. Um, and so I don't want the whole thing to be a bright white anyways. So my tactic is to knock down those values a bit. And then I'm going to um, erase out the brighter areas. So then those bright areas have a context of a, of a darker value. All right, so I think this general mass looks all right. And now we're going to work our way down from the top down. And one of the things that became really apparent to me um, in, uh, in the, doing that preparatory sketch is how important edges are in a landscape. Um, and I'm going to be utilizing the side of the pencil a lot through this because what that does is it allows me to kind of rock that a bit and apply pressure more on one end and less on another. And so I can, I can start to rotate my hand up, get a fine point, and create a sharp edge. I can roll it down, and, and as, that, as that contact changes, it, kind of, it can kind of scrape across the page. And so you can kind of control an edge, and you can start to create almost like a brush mark, something like that, where it's kind of sharp on one point and then fades down, um, kind of, I made that mark, with, I should have put that in a spot where I knew I needed a, a mark there, but that's something I want to kind of talk about as we go. Uh, so now I'm working in this area that kind of distant, those distant falls, um, and I want to avoid um, lines as much as possible to define. So rather than outline a form and then fill it in, I'm going to try to get to that form through these broad marks very similar to how I would be painting. So if this is the way I would be thinking about um, making my brush work as well. Um, and so it, this is really all kind of about pressure and trying to visualize a shape and getting to that shape quickly rather than looking to outline a form and then filling it in. Uh, and one of, so one of the things I'm looking at is as I see areas of dark, uh, I'm going to, you know, try to try to replicate that shape, um, and and try to get again, try to get to it quickly. And if it's wrong, then kind of adjust it from there. So I'm using my eraser to do a little bit of negative drawing, and then there's this building here. And, and this is going to be kind of critical. You can barely see it through the trees there, and you may not have even, have even noticed it. Um, but, you know, the eye is really good at perceiving straight edges, especially in a landscape. Everything is organic and has like these weird abstract forms. And so um, when we see a straight edge, our eye tends to go right to it. Uh, so this is, you know, what I'm doing is just starting to indicate where that building might go. And I'm kind of refining this edge, kind of erasing back to find that rock back there. And I'm going to knock it down because I don't want it to be bright, bright white. I, in, in this context, I can see the white of the falls here, which are really intense. Um, and and if, I, if I have my eyes fixed on this rock up here, this cliff, um, it, but I put my awareness on that white of the, of the water, then I can ver see very easily that there's a value here. It's not that pure white. Even though if you just focus on that one area, it might, it might feel brighter. So with this kind of area in mind, I'm kind of working up to the edge of the, the rocks. The trees are generally vertical, so I'm making these vertical marks up here, kind of leading up to that edge. And I'm just kind of visually, I'm not making a mark when I go like this. 
I'm just trying to visualize where that path is so that when I bring my marks down, I am kind of I'm keeping track of, of where, that, that, um, where that path should be. And so that's a different, you can see that edge starts to be created without having to create a line first. And that um, for, some, um, for some students is, can be a challenging thing to overcome because we're so used to um, creating a line and then filling it in. And so uh, if you've seen the series before, you know that my general approach is to kind of try to build up everything all at once. So I don't want to get too detailed at this stage. Um, Heather, you're asking, when do I know how to, when to alter the features of a landscape and when not to? Um, yeah, I, I think it is experience, but I, I, I think it's also a matter of really connecting it with it yourself and what you're comfortable with. When I'm painting, I generally, I love to paint mountains, um, especially here in Colorado, we have access to them. Um, to me, getting the profile, profile of the mountain is really critical. I want that profile to be correct because that's the only mountain that has that shape. And if I'm going to create a landscape painting that puts the viewer in that space and really um, honors that, that space, to me, getting that profile correct is important. It's, it's a portrait of that mountain. Um, but then other aspects of the, air, of the landscape may be less critical, and I can be more open with the, with the proportion. So like I said, I, I maybe will um, be not necessarily intentionally move elements in a landscape, but just be comfortable with them being incorrect, but maybe the profile of a mountain may not be. Um, so, uh, and then I, I know some other artists that they will build, almost build the composition first using things like a rule of thirds or, um, you know, some other compositional kind of um, construct uh, and then adjust the landscape to fit that. But I, um, you know, when I do that, I, I it typically then it doesn't feel like the space I'm in. And it's important for me to, to do that. Like, I, I kind of like to have the landscape itself dictate a certain amount of what the viewer sees. I'm gonna, so what I'm doing right now is I'm thinking in terms of positive and negative space, trying to rough in this kind of this mill building or this mining building back in here. Uh, if you do have any questions um, about the materials, you're gonna find them in the description below. I see some questions about it. I'm using an ebony pencil right now, and, and that's this is gonna be the only one I'm gonna be using. Uh, Vivica, you're asking about using a stump to wipe things down. I, I think that works out just fine. I'm choosing to use my hands for this, mostly just for a simplicity's sake. Uh, so what I'm looking at in the buildings, one of the things that stands out is the this kind of dark strip, the shadow that's being cast by the overhanging metal roof here. And I want to kind of block that in. And then the trees go in on top of that. And I notice the trees are relatively dark and on top, so I'm not worried about kind of working around the trees at all. And then there's a little bit of a highlight happening here on the, that building. And I want to kind of refine this a little bit. And I don't want to get, I don't want to get stuck in here too much at this point. I, I need to keep moving as again, part of my my process is to build the whole thing up at once and every part of me right now wants to keep working on this. <laughs> so I'm not going to overriding my instinct right now. Um, but I, I, I know I need to trust that because it's going to serve me better in the end. All right. So I'm working on these trees now and they generally have like this kind of triangular, very thin triangular form, but they also have kind of a horizontal element to them. You know, the branches, the way they come out, kind of come out horizontally. Uh, so the way I'm I'm going to kind of approach these a few ways and I'm just going to feel it out a little bit to see what works. Um, so holding the pencil this way, which allows me to create these horizontal marks more easily, um, or holding it this way, um, which uh, it, it also kind of works. So I'm going to kind of play around with it 
and I'm, there are certain areas, if I look in here and I blur my eyes, it becomes very difficult to really make out what's happening here. And uh, so I'm going to let this drawing reflect that. Again, I'm not getting bogged down in the details at this point. There's a kind of a harder edge down in here, so I'm going to change the direction of my marks to help facilitate that. I don't want to draw a line, but I, it, it allows me to create a positive and kind of negative edge just by changing the direction of how I'm holding that pencil. I think I need to move this. There's this right in here, there's that, there's that rock. I love this kind of zigzag form. It's one of the things that these mountain streams are pretty awesome. Um, so right in here, one of the, I was talking a bit about pressure. We have this white area here, that spray coming up from that waterfall. If I kind of wrote, roll my hand and I, and I put more pressure on the back side of that stroke and let it kind of trail off on that front edge, you can see how it creates that soft edge. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit, but you can kind of see what that does to that edge. And right there, that can be sometimes be enough to create that suggestion of that, that, um, that white spray coming in on top. So that's where um, understanding pressure and where you're putting pressure on that, the, the edge of the pencil can really become a benefit. Uh, so this is, it's almost like painting with a palette knife here. But I'm thinking about as I, as I work into the water area, kind of letting that pressure up a little bit on over where it hangs over the water to suggest that, that spray. And it's all very, that, that area is pretty small. Um, and so I'm not all that worried about it. But hopefully that makes sense. You know, I think you, it, it's really all about that power of suggestion and letting the tools do what they do. Um, and if it doesn't work, what you might do is just erase it, try it again, erase it, try it again, erase it, try it again, until you get a feel for that pressure. But that's exactly how I would be thinking about it if this was a brush. You know, how I, you know, how I hold the brush at an angle, straight on, things like that it'll put more pressure and make a more con uh, concrete mark on one side of the stroke and a little bit softer on the other. So, um, hello everybody, I see some new people here chiming in. If you are new, I'd love to see where you're watching from. Um, if you are wondering, this does go up as a recording afterwards so you can kind of catch up. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Scott with Artist Network and this is Drawing Together is the name of the show that we, we do and we're on We've had many episodes here. Um, so I'm just kind of suggesting these trees. Um, and if you know, I'm kind of changing up the the way I hold the pencil, kind of just based on what I'm trying to react to. But if you do have any questions about it, about what I'm doing, you know, let me know. Um, you can see how my hand is just getting covered with graphite, and I'm not worried about preserving that. Um, I just, I don't have that patience when I, when I used to work that way, when I would be kind of precious with a certain area, it would, it would kind of pull me out of the drawing and, and eventually I just said, you know, what? I'm, it's okay. I can make a mess. Making a mess is really critical in learning your materials. And so, um, but I know it's, it can be really uncomfortable sometimes for, for people to be comfortable, you know, working on an area only to have it smudged by your hand. Um, but I also recognize that you know, that those, those um, opportunities can, can open up, you know, the, when you do that. Like if you just, just see what happens. Sometimes you can make some really amazing marks completely unintentionally, unintentionally. So, um, so I'm kind of reacting to the form here and I'm trying not to be concerned with individual trees. And as I create these trees, it's this kind of alternating between establishing this the verticality of it and then the horizontal aspects of the light and shadow being cast by the, the branches of the tree. Trying to see where those marks are perhaps more dense, where they're more open. And I can come back in here and I can add some additional marks. 
Um, and if you've been watching the series, you may be asking where my shading stump is because I've been utilizing that for so much. And I just, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling the need to set that aside. I would think I was uh, kind of relying on it a bit too much and I wanted to see what would happen if I just got rid of it. What opportunities can I create? Because there's gonna be times when, you know, you're gonna be out in the field or you're gonna be drawing somewhere and you don't have exactly the tools you need. Um, and so you just kind of go with it and see, see what comes out of it. So here I, I want to, as I'm working on the shadow cast under here, I've got this at an angle. So it's a fairly kind of light mark down of the lower portion. But as I move up towards that edge, I can lift the pencil to engage the point a little bit and create a sharper edge at the top. And I can do that down in here as well. Kind of bring it up to engage the tip a little bit more, give myself a little bit more control flatten it down to create a broader mark, and it's a little bit softer down in here, and that's gonna be more likely to read as that shadow, because that shadow's gonna be sharper and crisper right at that edge, um, and it's gonna trail off a little bit. Uh, I do want to establish this. This is the light striking across on that metal roof. And then I gotta establish these trees now back in on top of it. So really it's all about suggesting the trees, letting the eye fill in those, um, the, the detail, because that's what happens in nature as well, is we don't stop and take a look at every little pine cone, every little branch on a tree. We take in the whole space and we might be drawn to one particular branch, but not all of the branches. Um, and, and so our minds are already primed to be able to make sense out of um, chaos. And so we can let the viewer's mind do that as well. All right, so I'm working down in that background and hopefully we can kind of see that space forming. What I'm doing now is I'm evaluating the perspective of the building. It feels like it's all right. It's, it feels like it's above us. Um, and that's because of these angles coming down. Um, and if we were to extend them, you know, it would, they would continue off the page um, to a horizon line that's somewhere around here. That's about our eye level. Um, that seems to coincide with the reference image. I do want to go back in here, and there are trees in here that help to create that form. So what I want to look at, though, there's this, there's this rock formation here, and then the trees kind of protrude out of that. So I want to be, I want to build these trees right up to that edge, kind of suggesting these triangular forms. And I'm again moving my eyes quickly back and forth between the reference photo and the drawing to make sure when I'm, at the, when I'm looking at the drawing, I'm mostly concerned with where I am. Um, and when I'm looking at the reference photo, I'm trusting that my hand-eye coordination will draw the tree, draw the kind of the specific form. So it's really, when I'm looking at the page, it's all about just kind of orientation and doing kind of quick check-ins. Um, and then here, I, I see some variation along that edge, so I might sharpen it up in some areas, let it be soft in others, and see how that reads. Um, I'm going to come down here, add a little kind of suggestion of some of those cracks, just utilizing the side of the pencil. There's something that gets is really, really interesting when, when using the side of the pencil versus the tip. And I don't know whether that's just something that as viewers we get, you know, we're, we have some weird subconscious trigger for, but, you know, creating a line using the side of the pencil, kind of scraping it across, it's more likely to read as texture and as you know, kind of natural elements, thin shadows versus a contour line. So I think it's, uh, that's why I'm really sensitive to lines. And we talk about that a lot in the series is that as soon as we, we outline something, it's a trigger in the mind that that line represents the edge of the object. So if we use too many lines in a drawing, it can, uh, it can be kind of confusing for the eye to make sense. Cause it says all of these lines are different objects. There's just too many objects. Um, and so, but it, it, for some reason, you know, utilizing the side of the pencil, you can make what essentially is a line, but it's interpreted as just a thin shadow. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, Anna, you're asking if we need colored pencils later. No, this is all gonna be in black and white. So uh, what I'm imagining doing here is if I were in the field, I might do a quick drawing as a study to, to establish the composition and work out the value relationships, of, you know, then I might apply that to a, um, a painting later, either pastel or oils or 
Um, okay, so I'm working my way down here. All right. That's a good question though about, I do get a lot of questions about color um, and perhaps we can get do like a, a pastel or something sometime. Um, but you know, we do have this series on Artist Network with Johannes who does these paint alongs and each, each Saturday he meets and we, uh, you know, we go through, uh, it'll be color, it'll be um, watercolor one week, oils another week, pastels another week, um, all dealing with a similar topic. So um, when we're working in the water area, this is where pressure becomes really helpful because you see these areas of dark in that waterfall area. That's the, those are the rocks seen through the water. Um, if we work down to say this middle area here, we see areas where that there's a sharp edge and then areas that are gonna soften because of that spray. So I wanna try to, I think it's helpful at this point to try to take a, a, a pass at this thinking about that. So I'm using, utilizing the side of the pencil, just kind of scraping it across, but I'm looking for those areas where there's a sharper edge. You know, right in here, for example, there's a rock that comes out so I'm kind of I'm leaning in, I'm angling that pencil, leaning in to create a sharper edge, kind of trailing it off. And then over here, there, it, it kind of trails into that water. So I'm gonna let that kind of fade in. But it's those areas of sharpness that become critical in our ability to understand this as a landscape. Because if we, if we look at this initial one here, if we were to just crop off this section, it would, it would make very little sense. And the same with this section over here. If we cover this all up and we look at this area, it's, it's largely abstract. You might say, well, it kind of has the light and shadow effect, but it can't really, it doesn't really make sense. It's the entirety of the space that is the indicator to the mind that this is a landscape. And then once that's triggered, everything starts to fall into place. Um, and these areas where we have these sharper edges and clarity help to pull everything else into place and we're more, we're, we're, we are more willing to um, kind of accept these more abstract areas as being part of the landscape, if that makes sense. So that's why it's really kind of um, helpful to, um, to take some time to understand where the areas of sharp kind of edges and kind of details are and where they aren't. So we've got this tree that kind of sticks up over here. That's pretty sharp. We've got this rock underneath. There's water kind of fall, spilling out over it. I'm trying to think about the flow of the water. I'm keeping my marks really light at this point, but it's all just kind of soft and being kind of covered over with the spray. And then right in here, it kind of comes down and then another stream cuts in across this way. So what I'm gonna do is kind of pull my marks up and try to find the flow of the water, the planes that those water, uh, each stage in the waterfall where they're at. And then right in here, there's a rock that becomes a bit sharper on this edge, and then it gets covered by the water on this edge. So hopefully that makes sense. And I'm gonna be, keep talking about those edges and hopefully it becomes more apparent as we go. Um, and I think it, it's like, it's like it, it provides just a little bit of context. And then once the brain has enough of those areas of context, it will, it'll accept the, the lack of clarity in other areas. Here, the water kind of falls down. So I'm trying to think about that flow. There's a lot of positive and negative space in here that we're going to have to work with, but I'm going to come back to that. And this is where it's helpful to have essentially everything mapped out. If you have the big areas mapped out, I can be working in this area and be, and be more focused with what's happening in that particular spot. So I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm, I'm in the right area. I can just focus on the, its basic form. And there's, there's stuff that happens in here that it's, it's a little confusing right now. So I need to try to make sense of this a little bit. Looks like there's this bush back here, a branch. Then you get these, these hard 
lines, these branches coming crossing over the waterfall. And so what I'm doing is I'm trying to hit those in one, one go. So I'm looking back and forth, looking at the form. When I'm looking at the reference for, form, I'm trying to visualize what my hand needs to do to make that form. I'm looking, checking in, make sure I'm in the right spot on the page. And then you make the mark. And for me, I want to hit that in one go um, rather than really kind of muddy it up by taking multiple stabs at it. Got to rotate my hand a little bit here. All right, I'm glad to see a lot of people come in from everywhere. Um, yeah, my eraser, this is just a standard eraser. My kneaded eraser is pretty big though. Um, the, the kneaded erasers come in various sizes um, and I'm, I kind of got the larger one. I like to have the larger one. I don't really know what's happening in here. So what I'm gonna do is kind of just trust the marks, try to look for the shapes. And I'm gonna, I'm, and as we, as we build the rest of the drawing, I'm gonna, we're gonna come back around to this to see what needs additional clarity. Um, I'm gonna kind of just be gentle with this area to suggest the spray. Some sharper areas where that spray shows through more. And then I need to establish this rock here. This tree was a real pain <laughs> in the initial study. Uh, so we're gonna we'll see what happens with it. But um, I want to try to just block off this form. And I think what I'm gonna do is make this rock a little bit, a little bit darker than I think what, the, what we're seeing in the reference photo. And that's gonna help to create some contrast and pull our eye to that stream. When it comes to water, it's transparent, but you still want to do the planes? Yes, I thought you drew water by making darkest place where the light would be less likely to get. Any advice didn't help when you get, oh, so Professor Blue is asking about the water. I, for me, Understanding the way the water flows is really important. Um, and in, in a few quick marks, you can sometimes suggest the way it's flowing, and that allows the viewer's mind to fill it in. Um, and the water that we do here in the waterfall may be a little bit different than what we do, say, in the ocean. So we, we have that drawing of the wave um, that we did a few weeks ago. Um, if you haven't watched it, you might check that out. It's a different kind of a way of approaching the, the drawing. Um, but I'm looking for the, I'm looking for the clues um, it, it, the value clues, as well as the, the direction of the marks. But I think understanding the planes, if we hold it in our minds and, allow, and kind of trust our marks to reflect that, that'll be helpful. So if, for example, in this area, it's generally a horizontal plane. Um, this comes down at about a 45 degree angle and then it falls off down here and it continues to fall off. Um, understanding what's happening there just on a basic plane can be sometimes helpful so that you don't get bogged down in all the, uh, the specific details. If I know that this is generally one plane, this is another plane, this is another plane, etc. So, um, the, and then it, building from the darks I think is also kind of helpful. Uh, as I'm doing these large areas, I'm constantly rolling the pencil in my hand. Uh, what, I was, what happened is I started to lose some of the point because I was making some of these finer details here. And so I'm just going to move over to this area, fill in some of those, that value that I need. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, and that kind of gives me my, my sharp point again. I think what I want to do now is kind of get this foreground tree established. And it's difficult. So if I were to paint this, I could see a color shift. Those, these background trees a little bit lower in saturation, the highlights aren't quite as bright, the shadows aren't quite as dark. In the foreground, we get warmer, brighter highlights, we get richer, darker shadows. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to convey that using only black and white because I don't have I don't have a temperature shift that I can rely on. 
Um, I don't have, um, you know, higher saturation that I can utilize. Um, so what I'm doing right now is just kind of in a positive and negative way, suggesting kind of that the outline of some of these branches here. Um, what's important for me at this stage is to think more about the scale of the marks than anything. Um, that'll help to bring this area forward uh, for the viewer is to make larger kind of marks. So I'm just trying to think about that basic form. And I may go back in this area and darken it up a little bit. Yeah, it's difficult to see what's happening in there. I think I'm stating that building a little bit more um, than what I'm seeing in the reference photo. And that's something that happens too naturally in drawing. When we know something is there, we often make it bigger and more visible. Um, and I've kind of invented more of what's happening up here in the top, I think. Um, but back to this area, just trying to map out some of these branches. And I want to just keep this loose. Uh, last thing I want to do right now is get bogged down in the details and getting everything right in this tree because it's, you know, I can, if, if that's something that works for you and you have the time, I say go for it. I, I just think for purposes of this video and my own sanity, I just want to keep these suggested. I mean, as you can see, I did in this initial study, very loose work right in there. Switching to this overhand grip. The proportions are a little bit off. It's a little bit longer, so I'm kind of inventing a little bit more on this side. I think on this side to kind of fill in that gap. The, the reference photo that we have here is really built for like an eight and a half by 11. Um, so that's kind of what's happening. I'm gonna try to map out generally this, this branch here. And one of the things that I'm trying to remind myself is that my eye is calibrating to the values that are here, interpreting those dark areas as black when they're not. Um, and as I know I can go darker with these forms here. So here's what I want to do. This is was really helpful in the, uh, the, the preparatory sketch is to see there's this shadow right in here. Um, so what I'm, as I'm making that dark, I'm doing some mental check-ins and I'm comparing it to other places um, that I've established in the drawing to make sure I'm in the right spot. And in terms of the scale, again, I'm, as I'm working on these various areas, you see how so I do that. I'm looking at this area here. How does that relate? I'm going to compare it to these areas up here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna darken this, this tree a little bit. And then as I as we work into these areas where the of the of the trees, um, of these branches, what I'm gonna look at doing is kind of sharpening up the edge, uh, you know, where there's there's this branch that's being struck by light, and then I'm gonna sharpen the edge underneath it. And as I darken the shadow underneath it, I'm just gonna be a little bit more soft with that edge. And then underneath, we, so we have the shadow here, and then we have another area where the light is, is striking, but we have these areas of dark. So again, I'm thinking about creating a mark that's kind of sharper on one edge, a little bit softer on another, and that helps to simulate uh, light and shadow, at least to the degree that um, you know, the, the mind doesn't get fixated on it when trying to view it. It's going to be more likely to be interpreted as a shadow rather than just some weird dark form. So squinting a lot again so I don't get bogged down the details. I'm going to just trust the shapes of light and shadow. Here there's this is the opposite. There's a kind of a sharper edge here and trail that up, feather it up a little bit, and then another shadow in here. So again, if I put myself in this place, if I'm imagining I'm in this location, 
This is how it would be re reacting to the landscape. Adding a little bit more kind of detail along that edge just to see if I can pop that out. So doing some positive and negative drawing. And then where am I? I kind of lost my space here. Um, how will I go about preserving this? I will not. <laughs> um, I don't really preserve my work. Um, but the, you can use a spray fixative. Just be mindful that it can um, disrupt the, uh, the contrast in the piece. Uh, it, it often makes things a bit more contrast in some, some ways that can be helpful. Um, but otherwise, I just store it flat and I'm careful not to kind of move it. You know, once I have it stored somewhere, I don't try to touch it. If it just stays still, it's gonna be fine. It gets all kind of messed up if I throw it in the car somewhere and, and drive around and it starts jostling around, rubbing against other, um, you know, works of art that you know, might be stacked in on top of it. And um, so I, that's, that's it. You know, if it's something that I really like, then I might put it behind glass, um, or get out like a Mylar sheet or something like that to help uh, preserve it. Okay, so I'm just kind of trying to think more abstractly right in here. Looking for that the dark shapes. And just kind of trust the materials to, to, to create that. Kind of trust that these dark marks, you know, they, they're abstract. If we look at just this area, it makes no sense, but hopefully in the context of the whole, it does. Our eye goes right back in past it and doesn't question it. It's not getting distracted by it. All right, so there's that tree is largely suggested. Um, I'm gonna come back into this area. I feel like this is a bit too dark, but before I fix it, I wanna get the darkest darks in there and then evaluate what that looks like. Because remember, values are all relative. Uh, they're, they're, we interpret a value based on the other values around it as context. Now look for this, there's a sharper edge here, a little bit softer on the inside here. I'm gonna change the direction of my marks to kind of reflect the, uh, the flow of the rock. It's one of the advantages to using the side of the pencil is that it lends itself to creating these kind of wedges. And again, this is probably what I'd be, I might be using a, a palette knife for if I were painting. And so you can see I've had to rotate my hand to get myself the angle that I need. Let's see, it still it does still feel a bit dark, so I'm gonna I will be going back in to lighten that up. And I like the tooth of the paper because it actually helps to simulate the uh, the texture of the rock. So I don't I'm glad I'm not smoothing it out too much. All right. Uh, Professor Blue is saying you've heard that lighter values can appear larger than dark values. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess that does make does make sense. But actually, I'm kind of surprised. I would say that darker values would appear larger. But I think it's all in the it's all in the context of the piece, you know. So on a white piece of paper and this is why I like to tone the paper quickly, try to get it covered quickly. On a white piece of paper, any mark you make is going to feel darker than it actually is. Um, I find that in terms, of, in terms of scale, if you're thinking of shapes appearing darker, or I mean lighter or smaller, or bigger or smaller based on whether they're lighter or darker, then I, I think really what's more critical is using outline versus shape. I, I think it's difficult to interpret the mass of an object through an outline. So the more quickly I can get to that through value, the better. Um, and then from there, evaluate what, um, you know, how it's being interpreted in the scene. But, um, but I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. It's not something I don't think I've spent a whole lot of time contemplating. So I think I'd like to pay some 
attention to that as I work. Hello, Tammy. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, Professor Blue, you're, you're asking a question about laying and values first. I think, yeah, getting to getting to the whole context, building relationships first, the sooner you can get to that, the better. Um, because then you start making relationships in the context of whatever marks are around there, and they all kind of form together rather than in isolation. So that's, that's typically the, the challenge is if you do work from kind of one area where you finish and then you move to another and finish that, it's difficult to make sure that they, they all line up properly. So try to get those relationships going first, and it starts with a basic understanding which one's lighter, which one's darker. And then once you've blocked that in, then you can go in and you can make a very specific decision about, well, how much lighter or how much darker is one than the other. Uh, because, you know, when I, when I try to work from finishing as I go, um, it never really kind of works, works out the way I'd like it to. So, um, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, so I'm going to bring in the kneaded eraser, and you saw me do this a little bit earlier, but as I'm, as I'm picking up some of the, the, um, the graphite here, as I'm lightening it up, I'm, I'm also thinking about the flow. And again, this is a kind of a mantra that seems to be forming out of the course is no matter what you have in your hand, whatever, whatever material you have, whether it's a pencil, an eraser, a shading stump, it's an opportunity to contribute to the form. So the eraser isn't just a tool to fix mistakes. It's an opportunity to create a mark that reflects your understanding of the space, the form, the value, the color, etc. So you want to think about everything as being an opportunity to contribute. Um, and that's what really held me back Initially, when I would, when I'd, I've always rejected shading stumps until I started this series, and it's because I wasn't using it properly. And when I realize that it becomes a drawing tool, then all of a sudden its power becomes evident. So as I'm racing here, I notice that it's it's not really picking up some any of the value. It's just kind of smudging it around because I've got this layer of graphite on top. I'm not going to worry too much about it. I actually kind of like that it's creating these kind of interesting smudges. Um, but then as I, as I bear down a little bit harder on it, then I can get some of these lighter values. But sometimes you can create some really cool effects by just experimenting with the materials and seeing how they, how they move. Uh, Anna, you're asking about a kneaded eraser. So I've got, well, yeah, I've got one here. A kneaded eraser works just like a rubber eraser. You can, of course, knead it, and these last a long time, and you can also shape it. It works great to just kind of press and pick up, and that's typically how it's used, or you, know, you see people um, teach how to use it. Um, in this case, I'm just kind of I'm using it as a drawing tool, thinking about the texture, thinking about the flow, the form of these objects. So that kind of suggests the rock there, and I think it's reading as a rock pretty well. I think what I'd like to do, though, is I think is add a little bit more value, and I'm going to darken right up along this edge, and maybe just trail it off, feather it out a little bit. Uh, be careful as you follow along the edge. You don't want that edge to be too consistent and even. You know, you want to you want to break it up. Um, you know, so have some darker areas, some lighter areas. If it's a flat, hard line, then it's really going to flatten things out, and it'll kind of pull us out of the atmosphere of the space. You can use these marks to kind of, su kind of suggest some cracks there. Use this to, to kind of suggest the shadow of the, those branches there. And I'm thinking about the cross contour of that rock, how, it, how those shadows might wrap up and around. You know, what you're thinking about will come through in your pencil marks, marks your thoughts. And so as you build up your hand-eye coordination, you can just kind of trust that your hand will represent and reflect what you're observing. But I think initially you could sometimes feel like it's a kind of a labor really trying to get it to do what you want it to do. But eventually as you build up the hand-eye coordination, all you have to do is really focus on what you're seeing and then trusting your hand-eye coordination to kind of manifest that. So, All right, right in here, I think this is what I want to establish. 
um, is this kind of shelf along here. And it's a little bit lighter in this area. Sorry, just thinking a little bit more critically about this. Since this is a foreground element right in the middle, I want to get it mostly right here. Uh, Tammy, like working on gray, pa gray paper, that's awesome. I, th I think that works out really well. We have a few in the series working on toned paper. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do is start to refine this area. I don't really know what's happening in here, but it's I know it's a dark form. And do some negative drawing around this to create this foreground branch that's that's appearing and I'm keeping my edges soft so this area is actually the water it's in shadow you can see some of this negative space in the splash I want to suggest I just want to kind of block in these forms a little bit because then as I build up these values here, it's going to affect the way I interpret the values here. Um, and since that's the kind of the main focal point, that's the subject, I want, to do, I, uh, I want to dial those in. If I get those in there now, they may not be the right values. Um, and then I, then I end up doing this area and I'll have to go back and fix the values that I initially laid down. So I just, I'm just going to I'll wait till I get this area more dialed in. Now, this is going to be kind of a, a nice spot here. I like, I like the way we have this wall of trees in front and then the waterfall kind of passes in behind that. That's an element I love to see in landscape work is when you have these, um, you know, one kind of main path that kind of passes behind another. So I'm going to provide a little bit more kind of a sharp edge along in here with this tree. But that's, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, when I, f when I took my first drawing class at MICA, you know, it, and really realizing it was Mr. Hennessy, <laughs> I love Mr. Hennessy. So, uh, you know, he, he really helped to teach me how to see and get beyond the, you know, getting bogged down in the details. And often if you, if you can find the shape of the light and the shadow, then that can be enough for the, the mind to fill in the rest. Gonna have a sharper edge along here where there's this branch kind of coming in. Um, Professor Blue is asking if I normally work on white paper. Um, I, I think I think it's really healthy to kind of work both, you know. And so I'll do you know I'll do a few in a row where we're working on white paper, and I'll throw in a toned one here and there. I've only done one in the series working on black paper, just building up from the light. Um, and it was okay, um, but I, I think working on toned paper can be really helpful. Do I have any good um, suggestions about books? There's another question. I lost it. Anna, you're asking what the shading stumps are used for. I can show you that. I've got some right here. Uh, this is, I have another question about the paper. So this is Hanamula paper. Can be a little bit difficult to find a notice here in the United States, um, but if you go to Drawing Together page on Artist Network, there's a um, there's a link there to Hanamula, and you can find a local retailer. Um, I I really enjoy it. Um, you want to find the paper that works for you, though. Um, I, I, there was a question I lost it about books, but I um I don't know as if I do really um. I'll have to think about it. Um, Art and Fear is a great book that I used, not specifically on drawing, but just um, to help me contemplate the nature of fear in the creation of art because it does play such a significant role. I recommend that to anyone. Then I have a bunch of books. There's a book called Bright Earth that I, I love and it's all about pigments and the relationship between pigments and chemistry and how pigments um, have influenced artistic expression over time. 
uh, one of my favorite books. Oh, this is another one of my favorite books. This is uh, that artist, James Perry Wilson. Um, he's featured in this book, This Windows on Nature, which is all about the diorama exhibits in the Natural History Museum. And I just love the background uh, paintings there. Um, that's something I look at a lot. And then John Singer Sargent was a big influence in mine, so I would look a lot at, at Sargent's um, work, do a lot of master copies. Um, you know, Rembrandt is great. Uh, George Seurat, I think, is a, it's a fantastic artist to look at for drawing. Um, he has some really amazing Conte drawings, um, and it'll really show you the power of edges um, because and, and the role of line in work. He really creates a sense of light and atmosphere uh, through um, you know, really just dialing in shapes of light and dark and overcoming kind of detail. And that's something, you know, again, that in a recent email conversation got me contemplating the, the relationship in the, in the role of detail. And I think it really comes down to what, what aligns with you and how you work. I, uh, and I've mentioned this before, I get claustrophobic with details. Like I, my hand gets, just feels weird when I, when I get too detailed and I just feel like I need to move around. Um, you know, this is really more the pace I like to work at. But that may not work for you. That's what's awesome about this is that we each have our own um, sensibility. We have our own visual language that we create, and we can't avoid that. So really kind of try to identify what works for you and, and how you just like to move the materials and then see how that aligns with the way you process information. And then let that reflect in your work. Um, oh, okay, I'm losing some of the questions here. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, if I used sandpaper for drawing on, I've never done that. But you know, for for pastels, I've used a a, a kind of a sanded surface for working on pastels. And that'll, that'll really chew up the pastels, but it only smokes, it holds it really nicely. So you get these beautiful colors. But um, yeah, I, I need to spend more time working on pastel. Um, oh, shading stumps. So somebody, there was a question earlier about using a shading stump. So this is one of my older ones. You can see I've been using it before, but you know, really it just meant, it's meant for kind of blending in areas, but then also I like to use it as a drawing tool. It picks up materials, so then you can use it to make marks. Um, and so I would kind of experiment with it. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do that on this drawing though. I'm not sure if I, I really like that. I like the tooth of the paper showing through. These, these forms in here are off. Um, and I need to ask myself if I need to correct them. Maybe I'll um, kind of suggest some of the, the branches do some positive and negative space. So this is definitely more kind of sketchy than uh, some of the other uh, drawings that we've done that are that are a bit more refined. But again, this is this is allowing us to confront the overwhelming amount of detail in this scene. There's just a lot of information. So hopefully what I'm going to show is that we don't necessarily need to capture all of that. Let's see what works. Um, let's see. I'm going to build that in. All right. How, do, how does that read? I'm looking at the, the image in front of me. I think I need a little bit more, more information here. You know, think about one of the... the um, I guess genres of art that, are, that really intrigue me are, are, is urban sketching um, uh, because it's all about being present in that location, reacting to the space, um, building a relationship with your materials. Um, and I really like to see what's coming out of there. You see a lot of people experimenting with materials, blending watercolor and pen and ink and, and graphite and uh, all sorts of things to, just to kind of be in that space and capture that moment. Um, and I, I feel like it, that's really kind of a cool space to, 
explore. So if you're looking for additional inspiration, you know, check out some of the urban sketching sites out there as well. Uh, Professor Blue, my thoughts on James Gurney. I think he's great. Yeah. Um, I've watched a bit of his stuff and, you know, I really dig his approach and, um, yeah, I, for me, I, I like to, in general, it's all about inclusivity, right? You know, it's like there's, um, there's no one right way to paint or draw. There's, just opportunities and there's just what works for you and what doesn't. Um, and so what, what might work for you may be difficult for somebody else. I feel like there's a suggestion of some of these branches in here that I'm trying to establish, see what that does. All right. All right. I'm kind of losing track here. We're already over an hour here and I just want to see if I can get this thing locked in because now we've got essentially the stage set. I'm feeling pretty confident about the value relationships. This is pushing back. It feels like it has structure to me. I, I, I notice the building. I notice the trees. I'm not questioning them as trees. Um, I get drawn to this area and it seems to keep me back there. This is in front of it. This is in front of that. So we're kind of zigzagging through. This is in front. Now I need to dial this in. And what I'm going to do is work my way from this way forward. I think I'm done with this spot back in here. I don't think I want to add a little bit more detail. But I do need to kind of provide a little bit more context in this area. So I want to kind of sharpen up some of these edges. Uh, Tammy, ooh, Greg Simpkins, I'll have to check that out. Professor Blue, how do you think your drawing personality method differ from most from the average? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, it's hard because I know a lot of our artists that work this way, they just may not have put their, you know, the work out to be seen. Like to me, this is the way I was trained at, at MICA in a, in a way, in the idea that to think about building up the whole um, and that's something that I've heard as well. We worked with Nathaniel Skousen, who did a, a drawing video on portraiture. Um, and he talked about that. He has a different kind of process slightly, but the general um, thought is still there to build up as a whole. And then when it comes down to the actual mark makings, um, that's, that's something that we all develop naturally as we work. That's our kind of language. It's like the tone of our voice when we start to sing. Like everybody can, everybody can improve their singing, but you know, we, also, we all have... A natural tone to our voices that that defines who we are. We have a signature in, in the way we write, um, and then that so that's something that comes out of that. So a lot of the principles that I'm teaching, I think most artists also incorporate. It just may be kind of expressed slightly different or look a little bit different. Um, I I I considered the way I work to be more kind of painterly, um, in the sense that this is all informed by the way I utilize um, uh, oil paint and vice versa. Um, if you look at there are other artists that have influenced me are uh, Edwin Dickinson is somebody that we looked a lot at in school. Um, really liked his work. All right, kind of back to this area. You can see I kind of <laughs> got a little scattered moving around. I keep coming back to these because these areas are just kind of flat at this point, but I might, um, I might give it some some thought a little bit later. All right, so uh, Nia is asking if Drawing Magazine is still in print. Uh, no, Drawing has been merged with our Artist Magazine. But we do, um, uh, I believe we have SIPs. We have like single kind of special editions for Drawing that come out uh, periodically, so. Not one dedicated exclusively to drawing. So I think that's all of that content has been merged with the Artist Magazine. All right, so I'm going to add, I'm going to be focusing on this and I want to be really mindful again of the areas of where that are a little bit harder than others. These thinner lines here to help to create that plane across there. I 
and just using the tooth of the paper, I don't know if, let me see if it helps to zoom in or out, zoom in, to kind of see that, that texture there. Um, I can kind of keep it parked there while I work on this area. Uh, so again, my eyes moving back and forth. Uh, you know, when I'm looking at the paper, I'm mostly kind of thinking again, where I, where am I? Uh, and then there's all of this, all this area where the there's that spray kind of dripping down. Now, if I were to watch, if I were here watching that, that if I were in life watching this waterfall, I would not be able to see this. This is really frozen that moment. Um, so that's one of the big differences when working with a, from a photograph versus working from life, that, you know, this, uh, an area like this it was, is constantly changing. And so I can, I can be a little bit forgiving. I don't necessarily need to render this exactly as a photograph. I just want to think that the water is spilling over differently here than it is over here. And so I want to be able to kind of reflect that. Now, so if we zoom back out, like that, then hopefully it, it all kind of falls into place. And using the kneaded eraser, you can see I'm just kind of pinching it, making a few marks, kind of dabbing it. And if I, you know, I've, I've kind of finished this area, but if I need to erase out, get some of these lights, I can go right over that edge and I can always re-establish this. So don't be afraid to, to kind of cover over something that you've, you've already created. So uh, now here we have a different kind of plane. We can see again, the water falls a little bit differently over here and then it comes across. You kind of, I've got all that graphite on my hand. I can, I can build up that value and then use my, my kneaded eraser to kind of suggest some of that white um, spray here, so, sorry, that was a very scattered thought. I realized it took me about two minutes to make that, st that statement, but um, trying to draw and talk is a little challenging. Um, so here, I built up that value, and now I can erase out the lights underneath it and look at the shape of that light on, on top of there and just kind of letting it skip across the surface, and that helps to suggest that um, the texture of the water. Uh, I think that's what is, what's kind of missing is right in here is a little light. That flow kind of comes back in there and this is a shadow. So I want these marks in the shadow area to follow the flow of the water because this, this, that shadow is, a, is water. And I need to remind myself that's water and not just a dark shape. Um, so, um, all right, what do we do here? Let's see, maybe a little bit. And if you saw when I was working this, rolling the pencil is, is a key element as well. Um, and I'm trying not to get, you know, I'm trying to get constantly roll that pencil so that I, I've got it kind of a new spot, but you know, just rolling it as you can, as you make a mark yeah, can make some really interesting forms as well. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. I think that's reading pretty well. Um, and then we come down here. I'm being mindful of that edge, just kind of prioritizing the center of those marks and letting it trail off the edge. That'll help to suggest the spray. I kind of have that rock suggested there. Ooh, so yeah, I, I hadn't ro rotated my my pencil very much, and so it, when I when I don't rotate it, then it creates these harder ridges that then leave these harder lines on the page. And there's this shadow here that I'm gonna I think I'm gonna emphasize a little bit more than what I see in the reference photo. So I think we're actually getting pretty close to being done 
with this because I don't want, again, this is all about managing detail, so I don't want to get bogged down in the detail. Um, and so hopefully this reads as a mountain stream and kind of shows you that, you know, out of this abstract chaos on the page with a few areas of kind of detail and focus um, or sharper edges, it's enough to provide structure and allow the, the mind to kind of fill that in. You know, the, our, our brain is designed to make sense out of chaos. And so we're just giving our, our, the viewer's mind an opportunity for that here. You know, this is, it's that same mechanism in our, in our brains that, um, you know, sees faces and trees and rocks and such. And, uh, you know, we, we are always looking for order. And so we don't have to, we don't always have to sh shout that out to the viewer. We can activate that part of their brain by just suggesting things. That makes sense. So, oh, let's see. Uh, Nia is asking, how do you deal with negative feedback or criticism of your artwork without giving up? I have a ton of anxiety and I also suffer from depression. So these comments, intense. That, it is so interesting that you asked that because I was just having uh, that conversation this morning. Um, I, I've definitely struggled with um, not necessarily negative comments, um, but I, I interpret them as negative. I put a lot of pressure on myself to to you know, and I, I would want to get that that positive feedback, um, and that's why I think it is it is important to be mindful of who you're asking for feedback. And I think I've talked a bit about this in the in previous episodes, but the who you ask for feedback is uh, can play a role in that because sometimes we ask people, hey, what do you think? And they may not have ever considered art before or have taken any time to think about a, a process and uh, and and what they just maybe know what they like and don't like, and that's fine. Um, but if you're looking for something that con that's constructive, it kind of puts them on the spot to come up with an answer that, that maybe they're not prepared to give. It takes a while to really understand what makes a good drawing, what makes a good painting, and what connects with you. Um, you know, what, how does a viewer interpret information? You know, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. So you just, that helps, you know, when I, when I stopped asking anybody for feedback, but I find the people that have given some thought to it and can articulate what they're observing. Um, and then hopefully in such a way that they recognize it as, as constructive and not, um, not as an opportunity for that person to, you know, to, sh to showcase their own, um, their own strengths. Um, and compare themselves to you. Um, art is all about getting better um, in whatever way that that is relevant to you. Uh, for me, what defines what I, what I'm trying to improve on is really connecting with my voice. What is authentic to me? Um, I feel like I once you've reached that certain threshold in terms of skill level and technical proficiency, if you can you build up a certain amount of hand eye coordination, and you can use the materials. You know, you have to meet that kind of minimum threshold so that you can actually convey what you're interpreting. Um, but then beyond that, it's really about connecting with the, the process itself. So one of the things I haven't mentioned in a long time, but there's drawing and then there's the drawing. And for me, I emphasize drawing, the act of it. And I, if, I, if I trust the act of drawing, then the resulting, the, you know, the product will hopefully be a good drawing. But it's all about that experience. If I'm enjoying that experience, that nobody can take that away. Even if the drawing itself is, it fails, if it gets ruined or whatever, that act of drawing is what I have and I can connect with. Um, and so if, you know, it, it, is, it is hard to treat to, if somebody is hypercritical, but I, to me that says something more about them than it does about your work. Um, and the better you are at are, are critiquing other people's works, the more you influence them. So if you have somebody that, whose opinion you like, but they're kind of harsh in their criticism and it's not helpful, um, you know, perhaps you can end up helping them. For me, it's all about the work. We all make bad drawings. If, if, my goal is if I can make 100 drawings, if one of them can be great, that's awesome. So that's my threshold, it's pretty low. If I give myself the pressure to create every drawing every drawing has to be great, then I'm just setting myself up for failure. If I give myself the goal of creating one out of 100 that's strong, then 99 of them are just steps to get to that. And so I needed to establish that mindset going into it 
um, in order to help manage that. So I don't know if that's helpful at all. Um, oh, <laughs> the halos. Oh, yes. So halos, are, I don't really know if that's kind of an official term in drawing, but when we, when we confront an edge, if we, if we work our way up to that edge and we're kind of precious with it, we often leave, it often kind of adjusts the marks. It gets all kind of jumbled. Um, I like to have clear edges in that regard. So right in this area, for example, if, I'm, if I try to work my eraser right up to that edge and I don't quite make it, it could get, be kind of tricky. If I just go right over that edge of that rock and then work my way back up to, the, to find that edge, then it creates that clear differentiation. Um, and then the same with, say, if I work in this, this building, if I work up to this edge here, if I'm kind of working, 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 and I don't quite make it up to that edge, it leaves this kind of light halo that we interpret, um, and that flattens out the space. And so that's what I'm trying to try to be sensitive to. Um, and it's generally, it's okay in some areas, but some, if it's too much, it can sometimes um, impact how the, the work is interpreted, if that makes sense. So, uh, Professor Blue, is it insane to put in so much effort to be good? No. Um, I just, I think we, we do what we love to do and it feels good to get better at it. Um, so it's not work. <laughs> uh, so hopefully that, is, that, hopefully that makes sense. Um, how do you, Professor Blue, how do you distinguish healthy motivation versus a deep desire to feel useful and competent so you don't feel like a waste of a person? That's a really good question as well. That's pretty heavy. Um, the, let me, let me think about that. Um, I do, here's, here's, how, here's where I struggle. The motivation for me to make art is for the act of it. It's painting, not the painting. It's drawing, not the drawing. Um, and that holds me back as a professional artist because I'm not making work for another person. Um, and in that balance between doing the work for yourself and doing work for another person is really the inherent struggle. So anybody who's watching here, if you're doing a drawing, it can be just for you. You don't have to share it with anybody else. I encourage you to share it you know, on, on our Drawing Together pages. It's awesome to see what you do, but you don't have to, right? It, this is the act of drawing can be just for you. It's just like dancing alone in your room or singing in the shower. Nobody has to hear it. Those are all things that are really healthy to do. And that's where I really connect. It's always been something that's very personal for me. When I have an image that I share out to other people, that viewer is going to connect to it in a different way. And that's a different motivation. If I go forward trying to please that person, um, then essentially it becomes kind of essentially a form of commercial art, which is, there, there's no, any, I'm not trying to imply any sort of value decision there. That's just kind of the, the nature of it. Um, there's a lot of commercial art that I think is really strong. Um, but I think when it, when it comes down to you, the reason why you make art Kind of be clear about that and that's where sometimes you get conflicted if i were doing this you know versus you know for someone else if, and you know and this is where it was hard in art school because i knew that i would be showing it to other students um then you know then that that voice creeps in that says well what are they going to think about it how are they going to interpret it um and that voice can be helpful, and sometimes if you have somebody you really respect and you, and you really want you want to know their opinion and how they might interpret what you're doing, then that could be helpful. You could say, you know, I, that you're right. This person would have would tell me my composition is wrong, so maybe I should fix that. Um, but if it's a demotivating influence in you, then just do it for yourself for a while. And then when you're ready to share your work and you know you want feedback and you can be clear about what you want feedback on, then you can seek that and you start, inter start to introduce that. Um, and you're asking you when, if there's a fulcrum where I started taking art seriously. I've always drawn. Um, I always knew, I always identified as an artist, whether I, I didn't really know what that meant when I was a kid. Uh, but uh, it was when I made the choice to go to art school. I got into, I got accepted into two uh, schools. I could go to an art school or I could go to a tradi traditional university, and I chose to go to art school um, to so that I could do it a hundred percent. 
Um, and uh, that worked for me. I know and at the time there wasn't kind of online learning or there weren't these other opportunities, but, um, but yeah. And then Anita is asking what medium I, I use oil painting for the most part. I do have pastels that I use sometimes and I have worked in acrylics and watercolor. I just keep coming back to oils is kind of what I work in more uh, specifically. If you are interested in more about how I think about drawing, um, on Monday, the podcast Drawing Inspiration, the latest episode was released and that was an interview with me. Mike, if you're watching, uh, Mike Henley is the, the host of that. Um, and so check that out, Drawing Inspiration. Uh, Jessica, the eye directs the hand to get the image in the paper. It's for the love of art, exactly. For me, I love the idea that our brain is processing information. So when you think about the visual process, you have photons of light bouncing around. They strike our retina, that, and those, those vibrations get interpreted and translated into an electrical signal. It's electricity then going into our brain. Then our brain takes that electrical signal and creates an image. Everything we're experiencing is happening in our minds. And what we're doing on the page is an expression of what's happening in our mind, not what's happening out there. And what we can do is we can train ourselves to become aware of, of where we're putting our, our um, awareness. <laughs> like what are we paying attention to? Um, and, and thus that affects the marks that we make. You know, we, 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 we interpret that information in many different ways. Um, and so the, and that's what's really kind of fascinating. What I love about drawing more than any other medium is that it's an expression that marks our thoughts. Every mark that I made here captures a thought that's in being influenced by you as well, because we're all here together. We're watching this. I'm talking, um, talking to you as I do this. And that's all pro being processed along with the visual information coming out as marks on the page. Um, and that's why I think I respond more to sketches, to doodles, to things like that that aren't fully kind of highly polished and we lose all of those marks. I love to see erasers and I love to see corrections on the page. I love to see where people made corrections because um, that's an indication to me of how their brain processes information. So um, hopefully that makes sense. I, I love that aspect of drawing. Art has always been, to me, art is about bringing me into the present moment. And for, for other people, it's about storytelling. Some it's personal expression. But for me, it shuts down the critical mind because it's about me being with a subject in the drawing. And I'm just, I'm just kind of bringing those together and not thinking about anything else. <laughs> so it's really more of a form of meditation for me, but it's different for everybody. Um, that podcast, I don't know if I have a link for it, but the podcast is it's called Drawing Inspiration, and the host is Mike Hendley. Uh, the Cubs win, saying that the, the rock looks exactly like the, the photo, and it looks like a hand. Interesting. Uh, what tools help my art process? Uh, thumbnail is asking. Um, it's a really good question. I really like to try all, all tools. I mean, I think really try everything and then ultimately it becomes about what works for you. Um, the term I like to use is working at the speed of thought. So what materials align with the pace at which you process information? So for me, charcoal is perhaps a bit more in line than graphite, but I'm trying to use the graphite in the way I use charcoal here. Um, oil paint tends to work better than acrylic for me just because acrylics dry faster and I like the way oil paints can be manipulated because it aligns with how I process information. Um, so, but try a lot of things out to get a sense for it. And when you do, you have to give it enough time to really get comfortable with it and then analyze how does this align with, with who, you, who you are and how your brain works. Um, do I do any kind of meditation? Uh, art really ultimately is my meditation. Um, I did study um, hypnosis and hypnotherapy as a way to understand the role of the subconscious mind in particular and how to, to teach art and how to consider my own art. So the idea that our brains function on subconscious programs is always really fascinating to me. Um, so that might be something to look into as well. And Professor Blue asks, how old I am? I am 42. 
Um, uh, your Judy, thanks so much for your help. Um, the, I bought a new kneaded eraser and it's poor. Um, this is a Prisma color, I believe, kneaded eraser, and it's working awesome. I don't know as if I made that conscious choice when I bought it. <laughs> Honestly, I can't remember. I'm like, I needed a kneaded eraser, so I picked it up. And uh, this seems to be working well. And if I if I do recall, I believe it was a Prisma color. Um, and then Cubs win. How to preserve it? I like I said, I just lay this flat. Maybe a sheet of mylar if you really want to preserve it, but I try not to spray fix. Um, uh, I'm glad, Mariana, that this is a good for you to do a landscape. Um, but I think we are pretty close to done here. I don't know if I have a whole lot more that, that I can do to this drawing that's going to make it significantly better. This is still a bit of a mess. <laughs> um, but I think it's all right. I think it still reads as that, you know, as a, the scene, as the space, pulls us into this area here. This, I think, is working out all right, but I, I could sharpen it up. Um, and so if I were to do that, and if you're following along and you want to give that a bit more attention, really look at, again at the scale of the marks and try to refine some of these edges here. Um, the, this area here, I think I just, I kind of lost, lost the basic forms. Um, and so I, I, I don't, I think I need to sit with this a little bit more to figure out what else I need to do. There's just, I'm seeing a lot of places that are kind of missing and kind of not interpreted very well, but that's all right. Um, so I might just kind of mess around, kind of experiment. You know, one of the things that that I really have to credit one of my professors for for doing that, and this might be helpful for you. My junior year, I I, I, I hit a wall where I said I'm really exhausted in trying to be the best in class. Not that I was the best in class, I was trying, that would became a thing, and, and it was purely pressure that I put on myself. Because I was 18, I didn't know, I guess I was 20 at that time, I didn't know any better. Um, so I, I, I went to my professor and said, I'm struggling with this. Um, and I would like your permission to do bad drawings this semester. And he said, sure, go ahead. <laughs> he's like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> so he's like, just, yeah, go ahead. Just draw, do the, do the assignments. You know, that's what we're here to do is we're here to draw. So that semester, I intentionally, I chose new materials. I, I stopped caring about whether or not it looked good. And I tried to put myself in the position of learning the materials again. Um, and that was one of the, the, the most productive semesters I had. I made a lot of work, I made a lot of really bad drawings, but I came out of it understanding materials in a completely new way that gave me a lot more confidence later on. And so I hope that you can all do that as well as give yourself permission to make bad work. Um, and in doing that, experiment with materials and just play with them. Um, and if you know on the outset that your goal is to make something that looks bad, that is a lot more freeing than doing something and putting your, the pressure on you to make it good and make other people recognize that it's good. So um, I wasn't expecting conversations to go in this direction, but I'm hoping that's helpful for some of you. But um, uh, Wendy, you're saying you're pleased with the waterfall in the, the house and waterfall and rocks. Uh, the bushes aren't good. Perhaps you can teach us either both of these another day. <laughs> Absolutely. I think maybe we need to come back to landscape. Um, a little bit more. I wanted to be, uh, Greg, <laughs> I haven't forgot about a, uh, a, a, bil a building. We'll be doing a structure soon. Hopefully this afternoon, I'm going to get out and actually get that reference photo. I think I know what I'm going to do. Um, so hopefully we'll be doing that. Um, perhaps more landscapes. The mountains are looking pretty awesome lately. So, um, uh, Betty, you're seeing a landscape painter and I've never had an instructor that had us look at negative spaces instead of positive shapes. Hmm. I'm glad to hear, it's interesting to hear that because that's something that I definitely use a lot in my landscape work. So, um, uh, thumbnail appreciation course, do you ever draw newsprint? That was always a warm up medium in art school. Um, and it has been many, many years since I've done that. Um, but I think it's a great way to loosen up and just go for it. Um, is, I use Rust-Oleum Ultra Cover Clear Gloss, interesting. And it doesn't yellow. It's a good comment, Tammy. Um, 
What's the longest I've ever spent on a drawing, Professor Blue? It was. It would have been in art school freshman year. I had to do. It was a two-week assignment. We had to do a figure, and I did a full uh, life-size self-portrait um, in charcoal. And so I probably spent more hours on that than anything. Um, so, but we had to get that done in two weeks. Um, I'm glad, Neha, that it was helpful for you. Do you have any 300-hour masterpieces? Nope. <laughs> no, I typically, this is about really the pace I work. So if this were a painting, I would pretty much be done as well. I typically, in each setting, is maybe up to two hours, maybe maybe two and a half when I'm on location. But that's really my, my, my zone, is in about two hours to do a work of art. So... Um, just, um, just a lot of really good comments. I really like seeing, you know, Jessica, Bramble, uh, JC, you're all making some really good questions. So I, I think I'm, I've been missing a lot. There's been a lot more uh, comment today than normal. So I'm, I really apologize if I missed a question um, that you wanted me to answer. Um, if you do, if you if, uh, st stick around, once this is over, the recording will go up. And if you want to post your uh, questions there, I'll be, uh, I'll be able to get to it. Um, uh, Betty is saying someone said once that we should paint three for the wastebasket and maybe one to keep. That's a good one. Yeah. Monday. Asking what's on Monday. I can't remember. <laughs> uh, I'll have to, I, I'm completely spacing what we have on Monday. Um, what do we have? Uh, dang it. I know we have another flower coming up. Um, a Dewey? I can't remember anymore. I'm so sorry. But we do meet every Monday, Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'm going to try to get the, the next one posted as quickly as possible. Um, uh, let's see. So I will <laughs> cry. I wish I could remember. Um, but I, for the life of me, cannot. Actually, let me, let me see if I can look it up. I know we're running along, so if you are just hanging around, um, this is pretty much done. I'm not going to work on this, but we're just kind of lingering through uh, looking for these questions here. Um, let me see if I can... Oh, I can't find it. I'm sorry. So, But I will try to get that up as soon as possible, try to get the, the next one done. I completely spaced. I know I have the next two figured out. Um, Jade, can I put my signature on it, please? <laughs> I don't often sign anything, so let me see how that works. There. There's my signature. And now I'm evaluating it to see if it messes up. So I have a, I have a real, like, it's a, a struggle for me to sign work because it's such a weird mark on top of this whole painting. So we spend all this time drawing and painting, and then we just kind of throw something on top of it that's a little weird. And so, um, yeah. I've got issues with signatures that I need to overcome. Um, uh, when you leave an art piece unfinished, do you find it impossible to get back in the flow? Not necessarily, because I think the way... Um, that's a good question, Professor Blue, because if you... If I were to work in a way that I'm finishing one spot and then moving on, moving on, I would have a difficult time kind of keeping that momentum going. When I build things up as a whole, I can stop at any moment and then come back into it and kind of build back up, knowing that that now it's a new experience and I need everything needs to change from that. So if I come back to an older drawing or an older painting, I just need to recognize that each session is an opportunity for it to become new, not just to continue on with what I was doing before, because I can never get back into that same space. Um, especially with the landscape, if I, I used to do paintings where I would come back three or four times, like like Monet would do, um, and you know, so I'd start a painting, work for a few hours, next day come back and keep working on it, um, and the light is always changing, it's it's constantly changing. So each time I do that, now I'm painting that new scene. I need to be in a new mindset. I'm just starting from a different point, if that makes sense. So. Mesa Verde, that's right. That's what I'm doing on Monday. As I, I have a reference photo that I took on a trip um, last summer. And so we're doing the cliff dwellings of Mesa Verde. So uh, Mesa Verde, those are the cliff dwellings, uh, southwest uh, Colorado here. Um, 
Well, I'm glad you all are having a good time. Thank you for the positive feedback. I think I'm going to end it now. Thank you for sticking around. I know this kind of went in all sorts of different directions. <laughs> That's a good day. Uh, so I love to see where things go. Um, uh, I think overall this is a success. I'm going to sign off now, and I will see you all on Monday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss it. And go to Artist Network. I want to see the uh, drawings that you post. So hopefully we have the ability to post the apples. Um, I know it was, it wasn't, that page wasn't quite up yet, so hopefully we can do that soon. Thank you all so much. I will see you next week. Have a great weekend.